Do you like mixing your lattes with like Bailey's or with like whiskey? What do you mix your lattes with? Um, I don't usually have alcohol in the morning with my lattes. Really? Why not? Like an Irish coffee, but like with milkiness. Not in it? like during the week. Like if I'm on vacation, then maybe we'll do something. But like if I do have Bailey's in the house, I will usually just heat it up in a little frother on its own. And then if it's too sweet, like the off that one is, and then the off brand is a little less sweet, um, I will add rum or whiskey to that. But I don't actually mix it with coffee. Oh, that's interesting. I would suggest putting like a shot of Bailey's and a shot of whiskey in with coffee. That sounds just delicious. Stir it up and drink it Start while your day on the while right side of well, the bed. Well, I mean, that's a camping trip. <laughs> yeah. For camping or weekends, not on your work in. Not on your work day. No. On that one, it's just straight whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you had to own a mythical beast or mm-hmm. you had the ability to call its name and have it come to you and you now have power over it, which type of mythical beast would you want to own as a thought as from the book or from just in general, general knowledge Cthulhu. Mm. Cthulhu. <laughs> oh my god probably <laughs> lord of chaos idea. over here just in a bird cage in the corner like, oh what's that <laughs> Cthulhu. elder god is yeah. <laughs> he's gonna pass bring right of now. destruction yeah, yeah. do not open that door maybe a griffin because they'd be pretty good guard creatures i think and you could ride them around and they'd probably play like kittens are griffins the they're bird? the lion eagles oh okay like f- lion the, bird eagle the head and forearms of a eagle and wings and then the back end of a lion hmm. i think i would go with the minotaur because okay. it is fearsome but also you could buy human clothes <laughs> oh my god would you dress it as it's wearing little suits Aww. yeah i would i would for sure that's what i was thinking little suits Top hats. Yeah. You Pan up from him... the bottom and you're like, oh, damn, somebody's in here sharp dressed. And you're like, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> you could put him in a Spider-Man costume. <laughs> totally go with like the satyr. And like, yeah. because then they can wear at least like, you know, the top part, like suit and stuff. And then you can take him out clubbing. Oh, my gosh. Welcome to Dog Ear Discourse, a nerdy little double date where we talk about the book we're reading and where we left off. Every month, we're pulling a new and exciting book from our shelf. We've broken them down so you can buddy read with us or just hang out while we discuss, predict, and nerd out. If you want to read along, right now we're reading The Forgotten Beasts of Eld by Patricia A. McKillop. All right, so where we left off was this evil wizard guy was trying to take advantage of our main girl, Sybil, and she was able to call the Blammer to assist her, and it tore the wizard to shreds and she was pissed that what his name? dread <laughs> dread had hired this wizard and so she had said dread is mine and that was the end of the first half of the book so the big primary characters are main girl sybil she's a wizard with that has power over a bunch of mythical animals corin of surly and he is a brother He has five other brothers. His oldest brother is the king of Surly, which is a little location, kingdom. We have Dread, the king of Eldwold, and that is a different warring location. We have Tamlorn, which is the baby that Sybil has raised, and Malga, who is the neighborly witch. Juan, are you ready to do the 60-second synopsis? Yep. I got the timer ready. Thank you, Chris. All right. I'm going to give you a count, and you ready? Ready, ready, ready? Yep. All right. Three, two, one, go. So we left off with Sybil pissed after her attack. So she makes it back to her home, uh, during which time uh, she makes it back to Malga, who was taking care of her. Uh, Corin shows up and sees how... She puts on a little sexiness on for him, and of course he is just absolutely smitten and takes her back to Cyril, and she meets the rest of the clan. 
Uh, of course, Sybil is pissed. 30 so seconds. she is plotting Dree's downfall. Uh, in an act to destabilize him, she marries Corin, uh, who now is without question in love with her. Uh, Sybil brings all her beasts down into Cyril from her mountain. 15. And she starts to plot in the background Ten. the downfall of Dree Dree in this ominous war. And then Five, something four, odd happens. Three, she kind of snaps. Two, one. Done. Nice. Well done, Juan. <laughs> All right. I'll drink to that. Yeah. Cheers, bro. What are we drinking? All right. So this drink is called Sybil's Heart. I was really like looking for something that was uh, a take on something summary because it is kind of summary here. So I went with a take on a Mai Tai. And the way that I went about doing that was we have about half ounce of pineapple juice, one ounce of light rum, one ounce of dark rum. For this one, I use Plantations and Knish XO. I like Plantations because it's like kind of, uh, she grew up on the mountains and so there's lots of trees there. And Kanish XO is like, oh, XO for hugs and kisses. But also a little snarky, like XOXO cover girl. Sure. Um, <laughs> and that's then, how I felt like Sybil was during this half of the book. <laughs> pineapple juice because it's, um, well, part of a Mai Tai and also because it's very acidic. Um, we have half ounce of orgeat. Um, it's almond syrup. Uh, a half ounce of lime juice that we uh, put together into a you know, glass, stirred it around for a little while with some ice. Then I took a bar spoon of black currant syrup because it's black like her heart. And I put it into the bottom of the glass and then poured all of those ingredients, strained out all the ice into the glass as well. I added two droppers of Bitterman's orange citrate and two droppers of Bitterman's habanero shrub because it's spicy and sweet and she's spicy <laughs> and she pretends to be sweet <laughs> and then uh stirred all that together topped it with some soda water because fizzy and now we have a drink yeah and it's great it tastes really good the color is like this reddish purplish brownish it's like a blush yeah it's really nice and it's just a little bit cloudy just like sybil's heart because and her intentions and her intentions oh, yeah, yeah. I love how it's a little spicy. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's yeah, just so. like a hint of a bite. It really it's, has like a lingering feeling. Yeah, it's mouth. nice. So Bitterman's habanero shrub is called uh, Hellfire, but really it doesn't it doesn't hit like a really strong spiciness that mm -mm. lingers for a long time. It's like this flash of like here's some pepper by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and in this drink it kind of just hides in the background and just kind of builds a little bit. And I like that. Yeah, if did you not... don't like spicy stuff, this is still fine. You'll, yeah. you'll still yeah. like this. I didn't even notice it the first sip or two. And then I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. It's like, um, it's kind of like if you had, I don't know, some pepper flakes on food or something like that. You'd just be eating it and be like, oh, okay, there's a little bit of heat here. Just a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's almost in the buildup that you notice. By the time you have a few sips, you're like, oh, okay. That's what that lingering taste. It almost builds up to a little, like... Uh, just a hint of heat there. I replaced the orange juice in a typical Mai Tai with um, the orange cream citrate little bittermans because I don't think orange juice really belongs in cocktails anymore. Um, and so, I mean, <laughs> That's just... a bold statement. In, How mature are we getting over here? <laughs> I just... I just Us mimosa girls are over here like, mm, I think we disagree. Mm, well, I, I, think... I like grapefruit juice more so as in a mimosa See, and, and would... instead of champagne tequila and that is no longer a mimosa <laughs> <laughs> and i think that's just my um my tastes maturing <laughs> and also like breakfast is nice but it's really good for like the mid-afternoon <laughs> perfect so uh that's the drink cheers everyone cheers. cheers thank you chris all right so i'm going to list out our last predictions for this Ooh, yeah. last half Drum of roll. the book and we were all wrong. <laughs> we were all very wrong. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mine was that she teams up with Corin and kills Dread, or as my husband puts it, Dre Day, Dr. Dre, and <laughs> saves Tam Lauren and becomes queen. And she is a reincarnated Lyrillin, which is the white bird that she's been calling out for. I kind of got, I mean, it's half right. She does team up with Corin. 
she has a hand in killing Drede. Not necessarily. She didn't do it with her own hands, but I think she had a little bit of influence there. Well, she was never going to do it with her own hands. That's true. So you're more like right than third, you think. Yeah. Third right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Kelly, yours was that she joined forces with Tamlorn against Corrin, and she's going to ride on that bird as queen. She did not do any of that. <laughs> nope, not that. That's exact. That's really not what happened. <laughs> Very wrong. Um, Mine. Cool. I thought she. Was, I thought there was going to be like a cutaway, and there was just going to be blood and guts on the wall and everything. And it's how it should have been. It's how it should have. It was my inner teenage self wanting to just rage at the wrong done to her. But, but she's not, a cold, cold lady. You're not wrong though. Yeah, I am. I am super wrong on what happened. Like. Uh, the rest of it was Corin comes to the palace a year later and everyone is dead and she now has to serve the Lyrilin. So you're there's some right stuff sprinkled in there. There's some right stuff yeah, sprinkled in there. I think I think I would have preferred a more uh, vicious route than the one she took. Oh, same. But um that's just my inner teenager talking. And, and Juan. She teams up with the king to take out Corin. So I think you meant king as in King Dr. Dre. Yeah. Okay. So that didn't happen at no. all. Um, she does not take out Corin. She's still very much kind of in her own way in love with him. And the Lyrilin is just a myth. And that, that's that was wrong. wrong. That's just wrong. So I don't know about the rest of you, but I was like pretty lost the first couple chapters in like the, of this half. Like she's like, no, he's mine. And then it just cuts away and she's leaving the castle and i was like okay but what happened what state is the castle and i want to know did she rubble it or what's going on and and like they she never makes reference to it i thought that was so confusing until like she's like oh no i left him alive I was like what are you doing i was so baffled yeah i took it as she may have been so scrambled that you know by the time she kind of came to her senses she was out of there i was confused about why she chose that route when she has all these mythical beasts that could tear him to shreds and yet she thinks that she needs to marry a guy of power whose brother is king in another area i just didn't understand her thought process on that because she didn't communicate that and she also has tam lorne so once tam lorne became king he could have appointed her as some noble person you know in that kingdom so i was just very very confused as well my kind of takeaway from that whole scenario was that she was happy to let tamlorn do whatever the heck he wanted to do like she raised him sure but then the second he'd wanted to go and hang out with his dad king dread she was like okay bye okay great and so he did and he left for what felt like months and months and she was fine with that she was like a little bummed that he had left but mm, whatever and then she gets called by the wizard and he's like, oh, I want to be in control of you because the king wants me to, but also because I think it will be kind of fun. And she gets really upset by the thought of losing her own agency. And that's when she decides to do something about it. She doesn't care about Tam. No, I don't. I, I, I agree with you. She's. I think she cares about herself and herself only. Yeah. And. Tam is the closest thing that has made her feel anything, but even that wasn't enough for her to take any kind of action. It was only once she felt like she was being affected by anything yeah. is when she decided to do anything. And she had a great plan, though, because she was like, okay, I'm going to strategically, like she played chess with this whole scenario. She she was like, I'm going to marry Corin because that, because that will give me access to his very powerful brothers. You know, so I don't know. I don't feel like Tam played into her plan at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think up until that point where she was called down to the wizard, she almost was looking at Tam like, you know, I don't think she was happy with him leaving, but she was also, she's like, he needs to make his own decisions. And if this is what he wants, then, you know, I will send uh, Ter to watch over him. But otherwise, you know, he kind of has to like figure it out on his own. And, you know, worst comes to worst, I'm sure she would she wouldn't mind uh, helping him out. But otherwise, it seemed like she was just like, okay, well, she was like resigned to the fact that he was going to go 
become whoever it was that he was going to become. Mm -hmm. In the first half of the book, she was so upset about Tamlorn going into the land of men and being corrupted by all of their hatred and their games of war. And yet in the last half, she just she, volunteers to go in there. Yeah, she's like, I'm going to do it. My turn. <laughs> and it's like she was so against it in the first half. And the wizard was kind of caught up in Dr. Dre, <laughs> King Dredd's like, plan. But also the wizard was like, just kidding. I'm going to do what I want and I'll have you for myself. And so I, I don't know. I just felt like that was kind of a play on like wizard power that King Dredd is just a human. He doesn't have any powers where... Maybe she kind of felt a connection with Corin because he did kind of have some sort of stuff going on magically. But still, I just, I didn't really get why she couldn't have just used her beasts and taken out the wizard and taken out King Dread and just rose above everybody as this like powerful witch lady wizard. I, and then she just decides not to. Mm hmm. Right? She's like, I'm going to play your games. Well. And I think that was a part of the reason that she went that route was simply to absolutely strip him of everything, like to wear him, make him suffer as long as possible. Oh, she didn't okay. want to like yeah. just crush him. She wanted to strip him of his sanity and bring his him like, kingdom. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah keep, strip him of literally everything and just dispose of a husk once that was done. He was pretty messed up the entire time. Yeah. Though. Well, she even said when she, when she ends up like explaining her plan, she says like, I don't even care if he dies. I just want to see him suffering. Mm. So she really went into this with a plan. I think after, I think it was chapter nine, seven, eight. Yeah, nine. Um, so once it hit chapter nine and she starts explaining her plan a little bit to the brothers and be like, you can't tell Corin. It's like, one, that's going to bite you in the ass. Oh, but yeah. also... Okay, now I get it. You're just vengeful. You're really, really vengeful. Mm. Um, and that's fine. I appreciate that. I would have gone a violent route. <laughs> that, that's me personally. I would have gone violence. I really liked that immediately after the, the halfway point that we stopped at, there starts to be this repeating theme of fire. I think that because that event where she got taken advantage of, I don't know if the fire is supposed to represent her anger or her going from feeling nothing to feeling something finally. Well, she had the heart of ice or mm -hmm. she was lady of ice. Is that what Corin called her or whatever? <laughs> so to have that be like, no, now fire everywhere, vengefulness. I'm well, hurt. He, he still calls her that, but then, but everything that gets described from that point forward is related to fire. It's her hair streams like white fire in the wind or his face oh, okay. was clear like a still flame or they go on a fiery night flight and the dragon felt a tremor of joy like a flame springing alive everything starts to become relating to fire and i think that it's kind of like something was lit in her that made her go from being like happy to sit in her crystal dome and call to the creatures quietly by herself to no time to burn this place to the ground so i thought I, that was cool yeah i have noticed cool. that this um author pays a lot of attention to the words that they use mm -hmm. and so i think that that super intentional one uh not by accident and i think you're spot on in your analysis of that uh but one of the other things that i noticed is a lot of foreshadowing with her yeah like, i noticed and, that too and it only came up after i read the book like, that's why this book would be good on a second read. Yeah. Is because once you know the ending, you can, it's, it's almost like some of those other movies where it's like, once you know the ending, you can go back and you can see all of the little cuts and everything. But like the Easter eggs. The and, Easter eggs. Yeah. The like, oh, well, that's clearly something weird. <laughs> like, um, but for this one, the foreshadowing was big. Like, the Blammers conversation with her initially, like, telling her that he wasn't he was called he wasn't uncalled right yeah. things like that where it's like i didn't quite catch it didn't quite know what it meant and also the boars speaking of how like how um corn's inner eye will open who's gonna lie to him then right things like that 
There was one that I had caught, but I couldn't remember exactly where it was in the book. It was brought up that the brothers will chase after the boar, that like, another animal would run free. I can't remember exactly. I didn't write this down. But it was like that was actually foreshadowed as well. Yeah. The whole thing where she kind of backs out of uh, this war and then just sets her animals free. And that has its own very unique consequences where now everybody is just like magically entranced by these animals and trying to capture them. And it's like it's like the biggest news of the century that they sell all these crazy animals. That was actually spoken before. Right. That those things would happen. And when going back to your fire analysis, in the beginning of the book, we all noted that the fire in her fireplace was green. It mm -hmm. was unusual. And maybe that is kind of a symbolism for that she's unusual. Mm. That, that she, that her inner fire or her drive is not the same as everyone else's. And then once she gets back to the, to her own house after being taken away for so long, the fire's out. It could also be that it's a connection to things because the only eye colors that we hear of are her own, which are black. And Corin and the wizard who tries to take advantage of her both have green eyes. So it could be that's the connection. So my the first time that I noticed the fire thing was at the wedding between her and Corin, which was really nice. They get married by one of Corin's brothers, and he's dressed, you know, nice, whatever. But she's wearing this gorgeous dress that is all red. And I thought that was bad ass. Yeah, and I cool. really wanted to see what that would look like. I actually went on Instagram to see if anybody had created any kind of like representation of it. And nobody had. I was no fan so art. So disappointed that there was no fan art of her wedding dress. So if you're listening and get you, on it, get on it. <laughs> I'll repost it so fast. <laughs> oh, man. Can we just pause and talk about how excited the dragon was to be ridden? He was, oh, yeah. he was like, it's time could to go. You, when they asked, could you keep flying with us on your back, basically? And he's one word answer forever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he was just like super ecstatic. Yeah. He was like, <laughs> yes, it's time to fly. Oh, he was yeah. putting on a show for him. He's just, like when the when you're on a plane and the pilot's like, oh, off to the right. Here's a mountain. That's this guy's just like tilting. His way. Yeah, he's like, oh, here we go. Like <laughs> roller coaster up and then down. Last episode, we had talked about how does the dragon carry all of his gold in the kangaroo pouch. I want to see someone's art rendition of the two of them flying through it, but not on his back, but inside in couch. Couch, kangaroo pouch. That's probably like a horse. They have saddlebags <laughs> and they sit on a saddle and there's bags for the gold. I have anyway, a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. This chick has been reading, stealing and reading spell books all her life to get the names of all these animals that she's only called one at this point. And she doesn't actually use any spells or anything. She is a wizard. She can probably do some sort of other stuff. Why doesn't she do any of that? Why doesn't she do any magic? She does influence. Part where she's trying really hard to keep her ulterior motive from her husband. And she's plotting with all of his brothers, which, come on, dude. Like, like he's not going to find out. Dude, I felt that part. I was like, that bitch. <laughs> so she hurt my man. Like, okay, so she but took he his memory comes away. And he comes and calls her out or notices her doing something, realizes that she's plotting behind his back, basically. And she panics. And without even thinking about it, just erases that whole part of his mind. And another part that happens other than that is she's sitting with the lords and she's directly like call, basically calling them yeah. continuously to the table to, to make them come to the table and, and do yeah. this stuff. So she's got this connection and then somebody interrupts her and she's just like, she starts breaking and he starts getting confused and looking mm -hmm. around like, what am I doing here? And she just resumes and was like, no, 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 no. Come back to the table. Yeah, yeah no, they're I, basically I at this, they're at the I king's totally table or I don't know, king's table. They're at this big, big old table and the brothers had asked her to call all of the allies of the king and just use her influence to be allies to them instead. So she calls out to them with her mind the way that she would be calling to these creatures and they all come and pledge allegiance to the brothers of Searle, even though, by all rights, they should be pledging allegiance to Dredd. Yeah, because so, they were loyal so to So she him. influenced all of Dredd's allies to switch sides. Like, that's some pretty freaking cool but magic. she doesn't do fireball. 
No, she doesn't do like spells. Like, and what? Why is she even like? Why does I she don't know. She has all these books. She has all these things that she could do. I'm just saying it's a lost, lost potential there. She could use her animals. She could use these spells. Like, there's so much more that she can do than just like the whole influence thing. She's just playing the long complain. game, Danny. She <laughs> wants it to be. She wants. She wants to watch Dread suffer, and if that means doing nothing interesting with her magic for years, that's what it takes. <laughs> I'm just complaining, but yeah. I'm just saying I would have liked it more if there was some other stuff. You know what this reminds She's me of? She's a wizard. This reminds me a lot of the um, Uprooted, where the the character was just like, oh, I'm being taught magic. Eh, I'd rather do it the hard way. Yeah. It really reminds me a lot of that. It's like um, you have spell books. You have like a lot of enough to, to make you have to strap them to your back. You have a lot of spell books. And you use none of them. Mm-hmm. Oh, you can make a fireball? Give me a second. Baking soda, vinegar, ta da! <laughs> it's like a volcano. See thing. how easy that was? No reading. All right. Well, the next topic on our list is talking about the detachment that Sybil has, honestly, to anybody but herself and her animals. <laughs> I kind of like her, honestly. As a character, I I like her a lot. I do not think that she has any amount of empathy. I think that she is kind of a complete sociopath. And it's interesting to me. Because I would react to all of her scenarios so differently than she does. She just goes in cool, calm, collected, cannot be wavered from what she wants to do. I would not consider her like a human. Like she definitely is a wizard. She has a whole family tree. Thank you, Chris, of these wizards that have just black eyes. And uh, there is a difference there. And I'm sure the the difference with her upbringing as well, having no family around. Like basically raising herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isolated from the world. So, I mean, I can't just, you know, you can't like hold her to the same expectations that you would a typical human. But at the same time, it's odd. She also goes months on end without like eating. Eating. So yeah. I have a feeling she you're right. She's not human. However, I can still hold her to hero standards of or protagonist standards rather. A protagonist I'd like to read about. She's not one of them. Mm-hmm. Like I I'm not a fan of her. Um I just I, I think know. she's kind of like a mythical creature or not human. That's why I had guessed that she was the Lyrilin. Like she, maybe she turns in like like in Spirited Away where Haku actually turns into that like dragon, the spirit of the river or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's why I felt like she, potentially she wasn't human and she could turn into this like bird thing and she's just one of the creatures. I was very wrong. But yeah, another really weird situation or view of hers was even though the wizard was like super powerful and almost broke her and she had such rage to call up the blammer and have the blammer destroy him and like get her out of that situation she also regretted killing him because she says that he might have taught her so many things yeah she was she was like oh well he's uh He's old and stuff, and so probably knew a lot. So I'm really sad that I killed him. But it's like, what? No. Weirdly, that is not one of the examples that I would have chosen as proving that she's not human. Because I kind of marked that down too, but for the opposite reason. To me, that's kind of like a hate the player, respect the game kind of thing. Where, I mean... Yeah, he kind of sucked, but he was really powerful. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yes, she was right. She could have learned a lot from him. She also doesn't think, get out much. I think that's the reason <laughs> she doesn't that meet people. I, True. I think the reason that I, I wrote it down as a, a not really human was because it was while she was still wearing the same dress that he tried to rip off of her. Like she was immediately like, oh, yeah, but I could have learned so much from him. It really sucks. Like she wasn't mad at him at all about what he tried to do except killing him like she was only upset that she killed him Mm. and and i I was like wow you really disconnected from that whole anger emotion very quickly and went straight from like anger there was a flash of it he's dead to you know i'm good i should have kept you alive so i could learn something from you how come she had she like hated king dread so much more than she hated the wizard well the wizard's not a threat anymore either (laughs) so if if he was still alive maybe that would have been different but because Mm. he's gone she has no reason to be mad at him anymore also the wizard he was just there to like carry out a plan this wasn't his idea somebody just came to him said hey you want to make 50 bucks he's like what's up 
So it turned it into the, though, it turned into like, oh, I could just not do that and keep you for myself. Well, yeah. After she showed up, he's like, well, now that we're here, I mean, you know, so it's hard, I think, for her to be that mad at him because all he's doing is just, it's the guy that made him do it. The guy that desired that had the her intention, to be yeah. broken. Like he would have just called her and been like, hey, you want to team up? Be Power Rangers together, rule the world. And she'd been like, all right, cool. This is this is going to be fun. I got nothing better to do. I mean, that's why she married Corrin. I got nothing better to do. I don't think but, that she cares that much about sex either. Because no. I don't think that that would have bothered her as much as it probably ought to. Because she uses it later. Mm. Because yeah. she just like strips down in front of Corrin and is like, hey. Let's get sexy times. Yeah. And but, now now we're going to be married. Yeah. Perfect. Everything going according to plan. But the, the king was like, yeah. I want her broken. I want all of her will gone. I want mm-hmm. her stripped of everything that makes her her so I can have her power. And the wizard was like, all right, I can do that. And the king's the one, the mastermind behind that whole thing. If he wasn't there, I feel like the wizard would have just been like, you know, I could have just, we could have talked. <laughs> yeah. Like you stole a book from me and that's kind of rude, but we could have talked and like, you know, done some good stuff. But now that you're here and I have to, I have to do these things to you. I might as well use you for myself. Yeah. That's probably why she hates the the king a lot more. Yeah. That's my guess. So another thing that she... I wouldn't say she regrets, but she just has like a very different approach. This kind of ties into her marrying Corin and love in general. Like it's kind of confusing because she... You know that she's using him. But she also, I believe that she does have some sort of connection to him more so than any other human because he's not, I mean, he's somewhat of a wizard himself, but it's not a No, I'm something of a wizard myself. Even though it's like, (laughs) oh my goodness, Um, even though that like doesn't come up again, it was, it was ridiculous. Like they brought up that Korn was like, had this power and, and he, he did, he never used it again. He has like foreshadowing where he has like this like sixth sense of like stories and how, what things like what happens and people's feelings and stuff. And then for some reason, it like doesn't even work in the second half of the book. Yeah, it like- does a little bit. I, I was kind of wondering, like, is he supposed to be like a Cassandra figure? Like Cassandra in mythology was able to know what was going to happen, um, but was cursed that nobody would believe her. And so I was kind oh, of thinking okay. that, not exactly the same as that, but in the same kind of vein, that Corin knew all of these myths and lore and everything like that, but he was cursed in some kind of way that nobody would believe him because all of his brothers were like... They were always mentioning, uh, oh, I should start believing what he says yeah, and like, said his entire life. Like, yeah. wow, I never believed you before, but now that I've actually seen a dragon with my own eyes, I guess they must exist. Yeah, in other words, he, he had to, like, basically ride a dragon into their house for them to be like, oh, well, I guess the dragon story is true. It's like, Christ, <laughs> dude. <laughs> yeah, but kind of like you were saying, like, beyond that, they don't dive into that. I think that that might have been, like, a plot point for the for the first draft of this book that got partially removed for the final version yeah you know it felt like he he really went from a he can he was starting to connect with her on the i can i can know things that other people shouldn't be able to know i've got a little bit of power and stuff Mm -hmm. like that too he's a patsy yeah and then that's all he stayed for the rest of the book he just stayed this gullible dude who's getting played by his wife yeah i was so embarrassed for him because Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just horrible to be the only brother out of the loop. And plus, it sh- he should be the one that really would get her because, one, he's her husband. But two, he also felt the same vengefulness towards King Dread, anyways. So, yeah, I guess I'm saying a lot of like things that were disappointing to this in this book, but I actually really liked the book. So I don't want to come off like, right. oh, I hated it. It was just, it could have been, to, for me, for me as a reader, it could have been so much more if she used different magic, if she used her animals more, and also if Corrin actually used more of his magic in the second half. I really like this book. It's just, that would have been like, turn this from like a four, which was what I rated it, to a five. I think like, even if Corrin 
like I want to stick with corn for just one more second. I think that even if it was just as simple as he went and instead of finding out by overhearing his brothers talking, if it was he was sitting down by the lake and he heard a story and he came to her to see if it was true mm-hmm. and she confessed at that point. Just like mention the fact that he can hear things that aren't right there. Mm-hmm. Like all you had to do was that and that would re-solidify that he has a little bit of talent, something <laughs> that brings that back and hits back on it. I would say that Corin definitely has talent. The man has a way with words and I will not... <laughs> You're such a fan of him. You're like, oh, yeah. he's a romantic. I, w- I was like, he is I don't, a romantic. I literally, yeah. once we hit the last half of the book, I didn't give a fuck about the war. I didn't care about nothing. I'm like, let this man speak. <laughs> the heartbreak that this man is going through, the disrespect <laughs> after abandoning his vengeance, the fire within him because he fell in love with her and she played him like a goddamn fiddle that some piece of shit bard is playing in a shitty pub somewhere. If you heard one of our previous episodes, we talked about the fight or flight, and I can see the fight in your eyes right now. You're ready to throw down for Corin. <laughs> yeah, I was 100% on his side. I was like, hey, you just tell me. We, there we is some to- rage bristling over here. <laughs> I think that really hits the nail on the head with he always uses his words. Yeah. And so when she explained her whole plan and that she married him out of this plan and all that, his reaction was not words. He, no, he yeah. slapped her. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just like open boom. hand though. Open hand, yeah. but still. It's <laughs> I was of... shocked. <laughs> what kind of slap is a non open hand? That's called a punch. <laughs> that's <laughs> or a, hit. a I'm hitting you. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a whole different level. And I thought that was I thought he went really easy on her. I thought he was gonna behead her. What? I would have. No way. Yeah, someone if someone confessed to me the only reason I married you was to get power. And to, um, you know, manipulate you and stuff like that. And you're just a patsy. Like the fact that he's so good with words really made that slap meaningful. Right. Like I cannot express how mad I am without violence. But that was also the point where I realized, oh, no, there's something very wrong with her. Because all she does is kind of like, oh, no one's ever hit me before. Nah. She doesn't care that he's mm-hmm. mad at all. She's just like, oh, that's interesting. Huh. I think she's just overwhelmed. She is crying and she does put her head in her hands and he walks away because she sees the image of his anguish even when he leaves her. And it's like burning in her mind. But I think she... That to me was... It's not the same. And it it was... hits a little different than normally people. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that... Like Corin, it's a little different than... <laughs> yeah. Like... A prince. <laughs> like the uh, the contradiction there, like you pointed out, Kelly, about like how she like she like has to go through with this thing, but also at the same time she like understands that it like that it's not okay. Like something else is going on there. It had me thinking the whole time. I'm like, is there something brewing inside? Like maybe the um, Blamor. I'm like, is is he taking hold inside of her? Is this what's going on oh. here? Like just the like completely blind rage and like driven only by uh revenge i was like is that what's going on here because you you noticed like a marked difference in her behavior Mm -hmm. which is why i was like yeah i don't i was like man this guy's got to get rid of her but hey he's in love so what are you gonna do he's in love she's not no yeah i I know i don't think she the the entire time i actually i think the only thing i uh i marked off was uh his his use of words his character's use of words um there is a section where she is questioning uh whether she would love him if he knew what it was that she was up to or how uh how dark she could be and he replies with uh what do you think love is a thing to startle from the heart like a bird at every shout or blow (laughs) i grew up watching mexican soap operas so to me this is right at home i'm like this is exactly how i was like the the betrayal and then the misunderstood like uh protagonist in this case corin to me because sybil is <laughs> she has fallen she's a lost cause oh yeah oh no but just the uh just the way with words that uh like how he's trying to explain to her because it's obvious that she's not getting it like the use of like 
analogies and metaphor because I think at some point you get to where you're trying to explain something like so passionate that there really isn't another way to do it. You have to like, it's almost absurd to, to think of how fleeting do you believe that love is that, that that's all it would take to be like, Oh, well, I guess I'm done with that. You know, there also was another element that I don't think Sybil realized was that the animals that she had under her power actually did care about her. And once she set them free that they tried in their own ways to help her. And I don't know if you guys wrote down that section of what they actually did. They basically played both sides to like be as subversive as possible. Just like, oh, the dragon just jumped in the middle of a battle and just scattered all the troops. And then the the brothers all... I the, like the uh, boar, yeah. Yeah, where he just like, come follow me. And yeah, runs that, into the and woods. Literally the entire army goes off <laughs> boar hunting. I love the line I, like towards the end of the book where Corrin admits as such where... He's like, yeah, there's going to be songs written about the foolish brothers that ran off in the heat of battle to go boar hunting or something mm-hmm. like that. Well, first, I one of the quotes that I had made a little post about was um, that harpist will break their strings over the songs about this war. And then it turns into after the chaos ensues of all the animals scattering all the ba- battalions and everything. And like what you just said. Yeah, everybody comes out like, what the hell happened? <laughs> so basically, right before this giant war that um, the Corrin's brothers have been planning against King Dredd, Sybil has a change of heart and decides that instead of fighting this war, she changed her mind. She doesn't want to fight the war anymore. So she sets all of her creatures free that she's grown up with. She calls them one by one, sets them free, and goes off back to her original home up in the mountains. She had told these creatures previously, before she set them free, they had like a war plan going on, her and her, all of her forgotten beasts, and there she was like, okay, only attack King Dredd's people, do not interfere with the uh, Searle people. And she also told the Searle humans, don't look at the beasts, because they're a lot more magical than you realize. They look like just regular beasts now, they've been living in the, the all of the beasts have kind of moved down, have been living in the gardens of Searle instead of in the mountains so like everyone's kind of getting used to each other she's like no when they get into their true forms you will not be able to resist them so just don't even go near them great both sides understand this she leaves all the creatures are free to do what they want they can go off into the wilderness if they want to they can can do whatever (laughs) what they all decide to do is fight the battle for her because they do respect Sybil Um, but they don't, I mean, that's as far as they've gotten is they're still going to fight her battle, but they kind of disregard all of her instructions and they just kind of like, they're leading anybody they can off into the wilderness. So they stop fighting and they're just like distracting and carrying off whole villages. The entire battalion walks off after this black cat because it looks so pretty. (laughs) It's like, wait, what? What? Come back here. Nope. (laughs) I kind of took from that, that they understood that she didn't want the war anymore so they didn't follow her instructions the pre-war plans or the war plans they instead did what they could to make it not happen oh okay and that's why they distracted everybody away from each other and the war didn't happen yeah that's how i took it as well Mm -hmm. oh that's so i felt like they they cared about her and they could understand that she didn't want the war anymore and that's why they acted the way that they did before they pieced off and had their own little lives. <laughs> that makes a lot more sense because I was thinking of it the way that my creatures would be and they'd be like, I have two cats and a dog and all of them would like do their best to do what I wanted, but their brains are not very big. <laughs> so they'd miss a couple steps, but yeah. they're trying. Um, I think that also uh, the boar might have had something to do with it as well because the boar is really wise, right? Mm-hmm. And so he probably was like, you know, guys this war is a bad idea because i one quote stuck out to me that sybil said which was i will set eldwood aflame and then find out if i am trapped within the ring of fire or safe outside of it oh. so she had complete disregard for her own safety on this war she was like i'm gonna burn this whole thing to the ground i don't know if i'm gonna live or not and all the creatures were like no well i don't think that's a good idea and you're not controlling us anymore so no war 
No war. Good. No yeah, war. We're on the same page. <laughs> yeah. We're all on the same page. Sybil's not uh, in control anymore. Yeah. Let's go play with some humans. Yeah. I'm going to run them through the woods. <laughs> yeah. So that was... Yeah. I did not catch that the animals might have wanted to prevent that war. But now, because especially that quote uh, calling out to me and your guys' comment and that. It makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Another thing is once we learn that the Blamor was actually the Lyrilin the entire time, which I was a little confused about that, but the Blamor had mentioned some stuff. I didn't write this down, <laughs> but essentially she knew the Blamor understood that it was loved by Sybil and that's all that Sybil wanted in her entire life. And that was kind of what saved her with when this, the Blammer returned again and visited Sybil in her sleep and then went to the king and scared him to death, essentially. Later that was mentioned, like, oh, well, the Blammer realized that it was, like, loved by me and that's all that I ever wanted and that's what it wanted. Wait, let's not gloss over this fact that <laughs> the king... Like, <laughs> the war started and the guy immediately had a heart attack. Like, <laughs> Yeah, he's like, oh, God. He heard the trumpets, and he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, but she she doesn't just free her animals just willy-nilly, right? She she frees them immediately after the Blammer came to visit, mm -hmm. right? And so that was what really triggered it, and she didn't know what the Blammer was at that point. She just was given the vision that, because the Blammer is the, the fear that men die of, right? It's what they're most afraid of, which is yourself, and she gets this vision of the Lyrilin with its neck snapped in half, which she's terrified of. She's like, oh, I'm destroying the thing I wanted most mm -hmm. by doing whatever this is. I'm just going to free all my creatures and piss off. And which is fine. That's what she does. <laughs> and then the Blamor comes back to her later. Right. And it is the Lyrilin and all that good stuff. But the Blamor is more of a. No, you got to you got to have some introspection before I'm going to respect you. <laughs> like I I'll, I'll just I, I see you're not afraid of fear. That's great. You're going to fear yourself though. She's only afraid of killing the thing that she wanted most in the world, which is the Lyrilin. She's only afraid of not getting the prize that she's been working so hard to get. Mhm. Mm in the first half, Chris, you had said that you thought that each one of her animals kind of represented some sort of theme? aspect aspect, aspect of the human condition yeah mm -hmm. so now that we had said the blammer was fear what actually do you think the lyrilin is because i feel like there's some sort of elevation there i think so the blamor is still fear and i think the lyrilin is the acceptance of fate mm. more than fear or not necessarily fate it could be like the accept uh, acceptance of that something's not in your control mm. or the acceptance of yourself either way, because the thing we do fear the most is our own actions. And we are the most anxious creatures about what we do. How many times have you had cringe moments where you look back and you said, Hmm, wish I didn't do that. <laughs> and then, you know, and then no Facebook shows you your post from 10 years later and you're like, Oh my God, I would do anything. I'd pay any amount of money to just not be that person 10 yeah. years ago. <laughs> So then, exactly. So that's that's you having those cringe moments. And I think the Lyrilin is you're no longer afraid of yourself. You're no longer afraid of what you were. You're more accepting of you as an individual. And that's where she really gets to in the very last couple pages. I think she realizes that she needs to um, do better and suck less. And then, <laughs> um, and then Corn's like, sure, I'll take you back. And... <laughs> fool and they live happily I mean, they ever after married. and it's it's like a i think that's i think that's how the the lyrilin is is like one the blammer is the fear of oneself and lyrilin is the acceptance of oneself what was the single thing about this entire book that stood made the biggest impression on you was your favorite you'll cherish from days to come <laughs> i really liked the I, again, we go back to um, language of book, like the language that the, that MacKillop used in the the writing of the book, and that I can recognize that there are things that 
if I were to go back and read it again, I might catch. Um, I don't find that very often in a book. Books aren't generally, in today's day and age, meant to be reread. They're meant, read one once, throw it away. Not throw it away, but like put it, put it on the shelf. But this book, I feel like there are passages that I might have glossed over that had more meaning. That so you need to unpack by right. viewing it again. Yeah, and either unpack or realize, hey, that was the the red doorknob, right? The you know little clues that there's a bigger plot happening that you're not aware of that they that there are plans and plots afoot, mm. right? So that's that's I think what's going to stick with me and why I would recommend this to somebody. Mm-hmm. I really liked the main character a lot, actually. I know that she is a f- very flawed individual and definitely not human, but I liked that this entire book, she went for what she was going for and she was not embarrassed by it. She did not let anybody change her mind or influence her in any kind of way just because she's a girl, she has to be this way. In fact, they've said that to her a couple of times and she was like, nope. I reject that. Like, I am myself and this is what I am. And I really am impressed by that about her. She made a plan and she stuck to it. She made allies and she kept them. Um, I think that she was a really interesting, smart, and strong character. I liked her a lot. Um, So I think that my favorite part about this book is the main character, honestly. She's also very unique. Mm -hmm. I've read a lot of books and I've never had a main character like this. And I do agree with you that even though she is very flawed, it's so interesting and she's not necessarily annoying. Like she's not Mm -hmm. barky and like trying to get all the attention, like a lot of female protagonists. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, she doesn't give a shit. No, like she's she's powerful and going to do what she wants. She's a strong female character that's, that's doing her thing. She's not throwing it in anybody's faces. She's not like aggressive about it. She's aggressive, but in a quiet way. I'm going to jump in and uh, see how this works out. But I felt that way about Corin, and not okay. necessarily her for this reason. I felt like her drive was not conscious. She felt a thing and she was doing it. And you felt a lot of contradictions. She, She's an animal. She, yeah, <laughs> no, she felt like a lot of contradictions. And I am. I love a good blind rage and just seeking revenge I feel like Corin, on the other hand, was really like introspective on what it is that he felt and why he felt that way. And he's he's like, I will change my behavior because he, I'm going to go after her, essentially, in this. And he, her love instead of right. my vengeance or revenge. I, exactly. Yeah, he gave up his hate for her. Yeah, mm-hmm. which love. he had been holding for I've years. Many, so that many was years. really yeah. impressive, Twelve actually. Yeah. yeah. Because he so, genuinely dropped it. Yeah, and that's kind of the, like, I guess maybe the reason, like, the reason that you were sh- saying about Sybil is also what I saw in Corin that he, he, he thought about what it was that he really, truly wanted, and he's like, I'm going to go after it. And even in, like, even in pain where he's discovering that he's been betrayed, basically, by her, not betrayed, but he was left out of the plot for whatever reason, even if it was for his like own good or she was just trying to protect them, that he's still like, I need to do what needs to happen, but I am incredibly hurt by it still. Yeah. But That's the char- true. both characters, I think, were good. I like that she had a lot of internal conflict with what it was that she was doing. And I don't even think some of the times she really understood why she was driven to that rage, but just that she had to do it. Mm-hmm. And you're right there. There is like no stopping her. She's like, I, I have to do this even if it destroys the people that I love the most. And I guess to your point too, Chris, where she's like at the end, she's like, I understand I may destroy the two people that I really care about. I don't know how that's going to work out for me either, but I got to do it. So I don't know. I think it wrapped up okay. Some of the elements I think kind of wrapped up a little too quickly. But To say my favorite part, I guess like the thing that stood out to me the most in this book was just the setting of there is a family tree of these very unique looking wizards like they have the trait of the black eyes and they can call these mythical beasts that are only known about in like legends and history and just one person's like yep this is my pet collection 
and I just and like they, they live alone and they don't need to really rely on anybody else and they're just in the company of these creatures and caring for them and I just thought that just was super cool um I wish I could do that. I wish I could have like a giant dragon, this like cool swan that's mm-hmm. just, like chilling on a lake. Like the writing is so beautiful and it's so atmospheric and just being in the woods for years and just having your own life that's has completely separate than, you know, the noble kingdoms. And <laughs> I just thought that was really, really cool. That's my favorite part. Nice. What were you guys' ratings for the book? I gave it a four. So I would definitely... There was a couple of things that bothered me about it, but I would def, I would probably read it again. And I would definitely recommend it. I am going to also give it a four. Uh, I don't know if I would necessarily recommend it to everyone because it takes a kind of patience to read. But um, luckily... But I really enjoyed it. Only 237 pages, so... That's true. It's for a certain type of reader, though, and I... I, So I think I would would have to... It would depend. Like, some books, I'm just... I don't even care what kind of reader you are. You have to read this book. This one is... I'll be a little bit more selective with who I recommend it to. But, yes, four for me. I liked it a lot. I would say my rating is also a four. I will recommend this to some people, but not necessarily everyone. Um... Yeah, it was good characters, good writing. I would also go with a four. Um, I think I would recommend this to most people just because it is kind of short and hopefully they can get through it. <laughs> but it is, I agree that the writing is very, I'm a big fan of uh, like economy of words, how much you can say with like a few words. And I feel like this does a very good job of packing a lot of meaning into short phrases where you almost have to revisit them and sort of unpack them. And I, I, you know, whether they're intended that way or not, they, the reader or myself, you read them and you can sit there and kind of ponder or think back on them. And I think that opens up a lot of possibilities that even though it's a short book, you get so much more, from it than just the 200 and odd pages that you actually read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the writing is so beautiful. And when I was trying to pick out some quotes, I I kind of was just like copying the book down. (laughs) I was like, no, that's that's not going to fit on an Instagram reel. Like, I can't be doing that. But also, there was quite a few times where I reread paragraphs. Like, there was one... Um, at the beginning of one chapter, she's talking about in the dead of winter, the the pond is frozen over and just how it looks and the swamp is still like chilling there. And it's just like, it was such a beautiful section of that. That's like, I wanted to quote it almost, but I mean, it was, that was just the, and that was just the beginning of the chapter. And that's, yeah, it was like pretty amazing. So yeah, I definitely want to read more from this author. Chris, you said that you read the Riddle Master what did you rate that one? Did you like that one? So here's the thing about the Riddle Master is I've read that over 20 years ago. <laughs> oh, wow. So it's been a while and I just vaguely remember bits of it. I mm. wonder if I would like it more now. I think the uh, time jump in it, because uh, I think I'd mentioned that already. And I will be honest, I might have the book completely wrong as to which one is oh, no. it. I believe <laughs> yeah. it's the Riddle Master yeah. that does this. 20 years ago, that's got to be written in ye old English. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those books where it's like, I think that that's the one that had this. And it it threw me off at first. I was like, wait a minute, I like that character. And now we're following completely different characters on book two or something like that. Because mm-hmm. it was originally a, a multi-book mm-hmm. thing, I think. But um, Riddle Master was, uh, I still have it if you would like to borrow it. Yeah, I would. I definitely am interested in reading that. Um, So at the beginning of this book, The Forgotten Beasts of Eld, in case anybody forgot what we're talking about, um, the author, and I've actually read the first in her her series, um, Gail Carriger writes a foreword in the beginning of this book and explains that this is her favorite and that if she had to pick one book stranded on an island this would be the one for her and i'm curious if you guys agree with that if would you consider this as one of yours or do you have another one that comes to mind kind of putting you on the spot here 
could only pick one book, maybe maybe three books. Would you consider this one as one of them? Can I pick a series? Yeah. Mm. I'm more interested in like what is your like ride or die? What's in your your stash? Mine would probably be the Bulgarian by David Eddings. Oh, I have that. Yeah, I there is something to be said for tropes. And this meets all the fantasy tropes. Nail on the head. Might have come up with some of them on his own. It's each character is their own trope and is awesome in their own right. And it's just a really well-written adventure. Mm. And I really dig it. And I don't know, there's just something about it. It also is one of the books that I read growing up. Uh, and I, I one of the book series growing up. And it just has that place in my heart. Um, if I had to pick a single book, like one book book, it would be uh, Ender's Game. Oh, okay. Or some Scott Card. Nice. I don't think this one would make the list. It is really good, but um, I think if I was going on a desert island, one of the three would be Firebringer, though. It's a book about deer that have a... It has like a chosen one trope, and it has a great battle that has to happen, and it's one of the only books that I've reread multiple times. Oh, interesting. Um, I don't really reread books very often because there are so many other books that I want to get to. So probably that one. I would have to think about it for the other two, but I don't think that this one would go at the top of the list of rereaders Mm -hmm. for me. As much as I really like the first half, I have to agree. I probably wouldn't bring this one because I would want to bring a book that was a lot larger that would hold my attention (laughs) for a lot longer because i mean if you have nothing else going on you're probably going to be rereading the entire day so yeah i would probably re bring some sort of best of collection of something like the cthulhu thing or the um hitchhiker's guide to Mm -hmm. the like one book that has like an entire like mini books in it um but yeah also i'd have to think about the one mm-hmm. that I would bring with me, but it would be one of those one where I, I could read it for hours in probably days. Well, we did mention a series was on the table. You wouldn't bring Wheel of Time. I would need an entire backpack to put all fifteen books. You on could there. Use one backpack, that. maybe a few, or like how Sybil has like just all these bags of yeah. books that she throws on the dragon. You, I would need that for the Wheel of Time series. You could build a raft with those and get <laughs> off the island. I would go with. Jurassic Park. Oh, okay. Oh, nice yeah. one, Michael yeah. Crichton. Yeah, I probably That's take a, good a one. couple Michael Crichton. That in Lost World, absolutely. It's got dinosaurs. It's got mayhem. Love it. Science. 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 I read that one when I was pretty young, and <laughs> uh, he has like an adult vocabulary because he's an adult, and it's a book for grownups. And I was reading it and it had a lot of swear words in it. And I showed my dad and I was like, am I allowed to read this? (laughs) So wholesome. (laughs) And he said, I could as long as I finished it and that I didn't bring it to school. I was surprised he didn't say yes, but just don't say them out loud in your head. (laughs) (laughs) Just skip over the words. (laughs) Wait, do I have to beep this one or no? (laughs) This is where we are putting the book back on the shelf and starting Girl, Serpent, Thorn by Melissa Batraduced. We will read up to chapter 16, which is page 163. Stop after chapter 15. And you can buddy read with us on our Goodreads and Instagram at Dog Ear Discourse and you are reading schedule for the year on our website at dogeardiscourse.com. And thanks for joining us today.